This time we are going to talk about the different parts of the nervous system, its different divisions, and their functions. And what are the functions of the specific parts under the various divisions of the nervous system? But first, let's begin with the most basic of them all, the basic component of the nervous system. Let's start with a neuron. So, as we learn from biology, a cell is considered as the basic unit of life. Here, we're going to learn about neurons. And neurons are like cells. However, neurons are mostly found in the nervous system. Okay, it's the building block of the nervous system. So, it's defined as the basic cell that makes up the nervous system and that receives and sends messages within that system. Okay, so it performs two types of functions. It does not only send messages to other neurons, it also receives messages from other neurons. Okay, so basically there are billions of neurons in our body and their connections with each other allow us to understand, interpret, and act on certain information. So, if you command your arm to move, basically, your neurons are communicating with each other. If you see something, like you're looking at your laptop right now, it means that your eye, the information that enters through your eye, will travel through the neurons so that it will make its way to the brain. Okay? And then, now, before we look at how neurons communicate with each other, let us first review the different parts of a neuron, okay? So just like any cell in a body, a neuron is also composed of various parts, okay? First, let's talk about the dendrites. So as you can see in the image on the right part of your screen, dendrites are these parts that I'm encircling right now, okay? so. What is, what, are the, what is the function of a dendrite? A dendrite is a branch-like structure of a neuron that receives messages from other neurons. So, in order for a neuron to receive a message, the neuron makes use of its dendrites. Okay, so it's how the information from another neuron enters the receiving neuron. Okay, and just like any cell in your body, neurons, they also have... A cell body or a soma okay so this is the cell body it is responsible for maintaining the life of a cell okay so just like cells it contains a nucleus mitochondria etc okay so after the dendrites and the soma we're going to talk about other important parts now let's go to axon terminals if dendrites receive messages from other neurons, axon terminals are enlarged ends of axonal branches of the neuron specialized for communication between cells. Okay, so this is the axon. Okay, as you can see, there are two neurons visible in this picture on the right side. So in, the, in neuron B, let's label this neuron A and this is neuron B. Neuron B, the cell body is right there at the back. This is the axon. And these are the axon terminals. So if dendrites are the ones receiving information from other neurons, axon terminals are the ones that are communicating to other neurons. Okay, so basically the information travels from the dendrite going to the axon. Okay, as you can see, the axon is made up of it's like a long line and then it terminates on the axon terminals. Later, we will have more about axon terminals. And these axons are covered by myelin sheets. These are the myelin sheets. And researchers in neuropsychology discovered that these myelin sheets enables the information to travel faster along the axon. 
Okay, so it makes it easier for the information to travel along the length of the axon. That's the function of the myelin sheet. Now, once the information reaches the end of the axon, it will reach the terminal buttons or the axon terminals. And let's have more about these. Now, here is another illustration of a neuron. So as you can see, this is cell body. This is the axon, the elongated part here. It is covered by myelin sheets. And then these are the terminal buttons. These are the axon terminals. So what are terminal buttons? These buttons contain tiny sacs of neurotransmitters. So when an electrical impulse reaches the terminal button, it triggers the release of neurotransmitter molecules. Okay, so I would like to highlight the word electrical here. So in other words, we discovered in neurology that Inside or within a neuron, the, the activity is mainly electrical. But when information travels from one neuron to another, the activity is chemical. Because they communicate with each other through neurotransmitters. Okay, so within the neuron, there is an electrical activity. You will learn more, more about that when we get to action potentials. But when we talk about communication from one neuron to another, they communicate with each other through chemical means, by the means of neurotransmitters. So these terminal buttons, depending on what type of information are you receiving, will secrete some sort of chemicals or neurotransmitters, and they will relay information to the next neuron. So as you can see in this illustration, the axon of this neuron is connected to the dendrite of the receiving neuron. We call, let's label this neuron A and let's call this neuron B. The neuron that sends information is known as the presynaptic neuron, while the neuron that receives information is known as the postsynaptic neuron. Then eventually, the postsynaptic neuron will have to send it to another neuron. So in that case, the postsynaptic neuron in turn will become the presynaptic. And then the neuron that will receive the information in turn will become the postsynaptic. So it's a continuous process and there are billions of neurons in your body. Later on, we'll talk about how the information gets relayed from neurons to the central nervous system, then ultimately to the brain and back to the different parts of the body. Some students assume that neurons are directly connected to each other. However, that's not really the case because as you can see in this picture, there is a small gap between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neuron. I'll highlight one of these examples here. So as you can see, there's a small gap in between the neurons. These gaps are known as synapses. So these synapses are the junction between an axon and the adjacent neuron, where the information is transmitted from one neuron to another. And later, we will zoom in to these junctions so that we will know exactly about, we will know more about the activity happening in these synapses. Okay. So the nervous system is not just made up of neurons. Eventually, neurologists discovered that there are also other types of cells in the nervous system. Okay, and that would be the glial cells. Traditionally, neurologists define glial cells as support cells or cells that support the neurons. They have secondary role, while the primary role is being held by the neurons. However, along the way, they discovered that glial cells play more important roles than merely being support cells. Okay? But in this case, here's how we're going to define a glial cell. So, Glial, glial cells are cells that provide support for the neurons to grow on and around, deliver nutrients to the neurons, produce myelin to coat axons. So we learned earlier that 
these myelin sheets these myelin sheets allows the information to travel faster within a neuron and in this slide we learned that glial cells glial cells help in the myelination or the coating of these axons other than that they also help in cleaning up the waste products and the dead neurons they influence information processing and during prenatal development they influence the generation of new neurons so we also learn from this slide that we have the capability to generate new neurons so in case a neuron ex a neuron dies cell death there's a tendency for that neuron to be replaced however there's a higher tendency for a neuron to be replaced if the death of a cell happens when you are young so the older you are the harder it is to replace neurons that's why we see older people having problems with memory with thinking with analysis because it's more difficult for them to replace neurons okay so that's the supporting role of the glial cells eventually we'll learn that they do more than support neurons they play other important roles in the nervous system now that we know the different parts of a neuron now let's talk about the different types of neurons present in our nervous system so there are what we call sensory and motor neurons when we say sensory neurons these are the neurons the cells that carry information from the organs or from the muscles going to the brain so they send information from organs to the brain so that it can be processed in example when you see something your eye will send that information to the brain using sensory neurons so the brain will process that information and if there if a response is necessary the brain will send the necessary response with the use of motor neurons so motor neurons will send information will carry information from the brain going to the various parts of the body muscles or organs now sensory neurons are also known as afferent neurons while motor neurons are also known as efferent neurons so the difference is that motor, motor neurons for you to easily remember its function efferent starts with letter e same with the word exit so it's from the brain going to the parts of the body so unlike sensory neurons afferent starting with letter a it's from the parts of the body from the muscles from the organs going to the brain okay so you will know more about how do the information goes from your organs to the to the brain when we go to the chapter about sensation and perception there's also what we call mirror neurons so when we say mirror neurons these are special types of neurons that was observed to be used primarily by monkeys in one scientific study there are some evidences that humans may also be using mirror neurons however maybe not as concrete as the evidence found among monkeys so mirror neurons are used whenever we are trying to learn or we are trying to imitate someone else so this is a very important type of neuron whenever we are trying to learn something in other words let me use this example you will know more about this when we talk about language and evolution there was a study where in a human tried to teach sign language to a monkey and then other monkeys in the area they were not being taught about sign language but along the way they also learned how to use sign language how did they learn they learned by observing the monkey receiving the information and further analysis showed that the parts of the brain that works among observers is also the parts of the brain that is being activated in the monkey who is receiving the information from the teacher so in other words if you are trying to learn a skill 
the part of the brain active in the teacher might also be active in your brain. So even though you're not yet able to perform the behavior, we can see some sort of firing or activation in that part of the brain. That's why most of the time we try to observe first before we do the action. Okay, so it plays a lot of a lot of a huge role in learning and imitating others. They say that smiling is explained by mirror neurons because when we smile at each other, the same part of the brain gets activated. So that's how we connect with each other from the perspective of mirror neurons. Okay, I mentioned to you earlier that. Neurons communicate with each other in order to relay information. So, one neuron will send information to another neuron until it reaches the brain. And it will also send information from the brain going to the organs or to the muscles. Now, neurons communicate with each other through what we call the action potential. So, it is an electrical and chemical process wherein positively charged impulse moves one way down an axon. So since neurons are like cells, they are cells in the nervous system, just like any other cell in your body, the neurons contain fluid inside and outside. And they have electrically charged particles called ions. Okay, and let's know more about these ions in our neurons. So the most common ions or particles present around the neuron are positively charged sodium and potassium ions together with negatively charged chloride ions. So these particles go inside and outside the neuron through what we call channels or gates in the membrane. And the, mem the gates in the membrane allow allows the ions to move inside and outside the cell. So these gates give way to the ions. So when do they go inside and outside the cell membrane? Okay, so let's talk more about the action potential. Okay, so... When you are not yet using a certain neuron in your body, for example, a certain part of your body is at rest, then it means that there's no need for that neuron to communicate a certain information. It's still resting. Okay, so for example, you're not minding your leg right now or you're not thinking about your toes right now, then we can say that the neurons in that part of your body is at rest. So, when a neuron is at rest, Okay, since there are fluid inside and outside the neuron or the cell, there's a difference in the charge inside and outside, and that is called as potential. Okay, and the difference potential between inside and outside the cell is at negative 70 millivolts. So it's negatively charged during the resting state. Okay. Specifically in the resting state, there is an excess negatively charged particles inside the axon of the neuron, whereas the fluid outside has a positive charge. Okay, so when does a neuron become positively charged? That's when the action potential happens. So let's take a look at this. So the action potential happens when there is an incoming impulse or in layman's term information see for example somebody mentioned your name or somebody touched your shoulder you feel ants or spiders in your body okay you saw something so you saw some object that's when a certain information needs to travel to the brain okay so when there's an incoming information there will be an impulse and then this impulse will move along the axon of the neuron, changing it from negatively charged to positively charged. Okay, so the incoming impulse increases the positive charge inside the neuron to a certain threshold. The neuron becomes depolarized, meaning it's no longer in the resting state. It became depolarized. 
and it fires an action potential. So when there's an action potential, there is a surge in positive charge. And when there is an action potential, the gates that I mentioned to you earlier, they open and they allow the sodium ions from outside the cell, from outside the cell membrane to move inside the axon. So with the influx of sodium into the axon of the neuron, it becomes positively charged. So if earlier it is say negative 70 millivolts, it's now positively charged, it changes into it changes into positive 40 millivolts. Okay, so that's how we know that there is an activity, there's an action potential in the neuron. Now, when the action potential begins, the action potential causes sodium channels to open and then eventually it will close. And this time, the gates for the potassium ions will open so that potassium will move outside from from the axon outside and then outside of the cell membrane so as positively charged potassium ions flow outside the cell from positively charged it returns to its resting state of being negatively charged of negative 70 millivolts so later i'm going to show you a graphic that will illustrate the flow of sodium and potassium inside and outside the axon okay okay to summarize the action potential so when the neuron is at rest the charge difference is negative 70 millivolts and then when there is an incoming information or impulse it will cause an action potential it will depolarize the neuron and then it will allow the gates will allow sodium ions to enter and then sodium ions flood into the neuron and then the influx of positively charged sodium ions raises the membrane potential to positive 40 millivolts the surge in positive charge inside the cell is the action potential so that's when the information or the impulse moves along the axon when the membrane potential reaches 40 millivolts, the sodium channels close and this time the potassium gates open and there is an outflow of positively charged potassium ions. And because positive charge, positively charged potassium is exiting the cell, it now returns to its negative, negative state or resting state. Okay, and it will now go back to the negative 70 millivolts so this happens in a very short amount of time okay so this is what happens okay so it is arranged chronologically from left to right so in the resting potential as you can see the fluid outside the axon contains higher concentration of positive ions than the inside which is mainly containing negatively charged anions so when there is an incoming impulse the sodium gates open so that the sodium ions will enter the axon and this shiny area here is just an illustration for the for the impulse so it moves along the axon it moves along the axon so that's why you can see on the on the image c here the impulse is already on the right side. Now that the impulse has moved along the axon, as you can see, this part will now return to its resting potential. As you can see here, the potassium ions are now moving out of the cell through the potassium gate. So they use different channels or different gates. Okay, so this happens in a very short amount of time and this is all these are all summarized in the image above so everything began in the resting potential that's negative 70 millivolts when the positively charged ions flood the cell it changes from negatively charged to positively charged it became depolarized and eventually when that when the information moves along the axon 
it goes back to its resting potential. There's a very short amount of time that a neuron will not be able to fire again because it just fired or an action potential just happened recently and we call that the refractory period. Okay. Now that you know what happens inside the neuron, specifically inside the axon during an action potential, now let's take a look at what happens between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neurons. If you remember our discussion earlier, they are not really connected to each other, but there's a small gap in between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neuron, and these are synapses. So this is how the edge of a synapse looks like. So this is magnified in this image here. So these are the synaptic vesicles. These are tiny sacs in the terminal that contains chemical messengers or neurotransmitters. So it depends what kind of information enters. It will also, this information will determine what kind of neurotransmitter will be released or what kind of message will be sent to the receiving neuron. And later on, we will learn about the different neurotransmitters that are present in our body. Now, let's take a look at the activity happening in between the two neurons. So, when the impulse reaches the end of the neuron, the neurotransmitters will be released to the receiving neuron. And just like a lock and a key, a certain neurotransmitter will look for a certain receptor. So if a neurotransmitter will not be compatible to that receptor, then that receptor will not accept that neurotransmitter. In other words, there are times wherein the neurotransmitter remains in the synaptic cleft because there's an excess neurotransmitter in the synapses. And these neurotransmitters, these excess neurotransmitters, need to be removed. So what can what does the what are the mechanisms involved in the removal of these excess neurotransmitters? First there is what we call reuptake. When we say reuptake, the presynaptic neuron has the tendency to return excess neurotransmitter. There's a tendency for the excess neurotransmitter to be returned to the presynaptic neuron. So it reabsorbs the neurotransmitter that it released so that it can be used in the future. So that's for reuptake. The neurotransmitter is being reabsorbed again. But that is not the only way that we get rid of excess neurotransmitter. We also have what we call degradation. On the other hand, when we say degradation, this happens when there are enzymes that attach themselves to neurotransmitters and these en enzymes destroy the excess neurotransmitters. So there are two mechanisms in the removal of excess neurotransmitters in the synapses. Now, it's time to look at the specific neurotransmitters that are present in our body. Okay, first we have here what we call acetylcholine. So when we say acetylcholine or ACTH, its main function is to slow the activity of the autonomic nervous system. So it's involved in eating, drinking, neuromuscular junction. Sometimes it's also involved in learning, memory, sleeping, and dreaming. What they say is that among people with Alzheimer's disease, they have low amounts of acetylcholine. Okay, so interventions among people with Alzheimer's may include acetylcholine um, interventions. Next, this is familiar to most of us, dopamine. So dopamine plays a very important role in arousal, mood, specifically positive mood, and voluntary muscle control. Sometimes there, there is a hypothesis saying that when there is too much dopamine in our body, it may be a predictor of schizophrenia.
That's why there are some people with schizophrenia who are being treated by drugs that block the activity of dopamine. Like okay, so to reduce the amount of dopamine in their body. Next, we have here what we call epinephrine. So if you're English, you're going to call this adrenaline. So adrenaline is being used or epinephrine is being is its main function is to increase the activity of the autonomic nervous system so it's involved in what we call the fight or flight response so whenever you are stressed there's an emergency there's an adrenaline rush or there is a, your body makes use of these chemical messengers to be more active to respond in a certain way whether to fight the threat or to flee from the situation next we have here what we call norepinephrine or noradrenaline so it affects the activity of the central nervous system it's important in alertness and attention next here we have what we call serotonin so serotonin plays a huge role in regulation particularly it regulates mood it helps in sleep eating etc so there are some the biological explanation for anxiety and depression is that there's a low supply of serotonin in their body so what antidepressants do is that they block the reuptake of serotonin in other words there are certain drugs that prevent reuptake so that there will be no undersupply of a certain neurotransmitter okay so if the drug will block the reuptake of serotonin, then there will be no undersupply. That's one way to treat to treat conditions with relation to negative mood, just like depression or depressive symptoms. Next here we have what we call GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid. It's it's a major inhibitory neurotransmitters. The others are excitatory. This is in charge of inhibition. So what it, do, what it does is that it slows the activity of the central nervous system. So GABA is, so it's like the brain police. It tells you to relax. It, it relaxes your body. It inhibits your central nervous system activity. What they say is that among people with anxiety, there is an undersupply of GABA. So that's why people with generalized anxiety disorder have difficulty stopping themselves from stopping themselves when it comes to worrying or being anxious because they have low amounts of GABA. So among people who don't have anxiety disorders, they have the optimal amount of GABA. That's why you know when to stop thinking about something or when to stop worrying. That's why some interventions with relates to anxiety may also relate to um, GABA interventions. And lastly, we have here what we call glutamate. So it's the most common excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, also involved in learning and memory. And there are some evidences saying that glutamate may also be involved in schizophrenia. Okay, so it's time to recap what we have talked about so the brain is composed of neurons and glial cells so like what i mentioned to you before scientists used to consider glial cells as support structure but along the way they realized that glial cells play other important roles than merely being support so there are two types of glial cells according to neuroscience which are oligodendrocytes so and schwann cells Oligodendrocytes are present in the CNS, while Schwann cells are present in the peripheral nervous system. Later, we'll talk about the divisions of the nervous system. Okay, so again, they're responsible in myelination and myelin sheets, insulates axons. In other words, they speed up the transmission of the neural message along the axon. Again, what are neurons? So neurons are specialized cells in the nervous system that receive and send messages within that system so they have components such as the dendrites receiving for receiving information the soma or the cell body and the axon where the information goes along or the impulse goes along 
and the axon has what we call axon terminals and the axon terminals are this is where we can find the axon terminals is where the the neuron ends and between the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron there's a synapse there's a gap called the synapse where nerve impulses reaches axon terminals and they release neurotransmitter into the synaptic space okay and neurons have an electrical charge at rest um, it's called the resting potential but when there is an information coming in okay there is an influx of sodium into the cell allowing the action potential to happen or the neural firing to happen okay so that is it for our summary about neurons and neural activity in the nervous system now that we are done talking about the neuron or the building block of the nervous system let's discuss the divisions of the nervous system so let's see here the nervous system is primarily divided into two major divisions the central and the peripheral nervous system so the central nervous system are composed of the brain and the spinal cord the role of the brain is to interpret and store information as well as sending signals to muscles, glands, and organs. On the other hand, the spinal cord is the pathway or the bridge connecting the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Now, the peripheral nervous system is in charge of transmitting or transporting information to and from the central nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system has two major divisions, autonomic and somatic. Earlier, we have discussed, we have somehow discussed the somatic nervous system. And the somatic nervous system is in charge of carrying sensory information and controlling movement of the skeletal muscles. So when we say sensory system, this is the system in charge of carrying information from the senses to the brain. On the other hand, motor system is in charge of carrying the information from the central nervous system to the various parts of the body, such as muscles and glands. On the other hand, when we say autonomic nervous system, this is in charge of automatically regulating glands, internal organs, blood vessels, fuel dilation, digestion, blood pressure, and other automatic processes happening in our body so this is divided into two divisions parasympathetic and sympathetic division when we say parasympathetic division of the nervous system this is in charge of our day-to-day -day ordinary functions okay on the other hand the sympathetic division becomes active when we are in a threatening situation such as situations that calls for a fight or flight response so it prepares the body to react and expend energy in times of stress okay so there you go those are the parts of the nervous system in this lecture we are going to specifically take a look at the major parts of the brain and their various functions so the brain is a collection of neurons and glial cells that control the major functions of the body. It produces thoughts, emotions, behavior, which makes us human. So along the way in this course, we will learn about the complexity of the brain. And maybe this course will allow you to raise more questions about the brain. And we will try to answer that by providing and communicating some of the results of the recent research involving the brain, its structure, and its functions. We will try to answer the different myths about the functions of the brain. Sometimes we will discuss also interventions and treatments when there are damages to the nervous system. Okay, now let's review what are the various parts of the brain and I'll try to make the lecture as simple as possible okay so an overview of the human brain first so in evolutionary terms the brain is a result of few hundred million years of natural selection and 
in this hundred million years of evolution and natural selection, there are three major parts of the brain that that develop. So from earliest to the newest in order, these are the hind brain, the, the mid brain, and the forebrain. So I hope that you can follow by looking at the picture on the right side of our slide. So it means that the hind brain is the oldest part, the mid brain follows the hind brain, while the forebrain is the youngest or the newest part according to evolutionary views or evolutionary perspectives. Let's discuss it part by part, beginning with the hindbrain. The hindbrain is the oldest region in the brain. Okay, It's the region directly connected to the spinal cord. And the main role of the hindbrain, of this part of the brain, so it's composed of pons, cerebellum, and medulla. Of course, there are other structures present here, but what I'm doing right now is just to give you an overview of the most important structures that you're going to hear repeatedly in this course. So it's in charge of things like regulating breathing, heart rate, arousal, and other basic functions of survival. It makes sense that this was the earliest part of the brain to develop because our ancestors, in order for them to survive natural selection, then they must be able to, to develop strategies or functions for survival. So what are the roles of the parts of the brain in this area? So first, let's talk about the medulla. So the medulla is in charge of regulating breathing, heart rate, blood pressure. So it's involved in a lot of involuntary processes in our body. Okay, so... Sometimes it's also involved in coughing, swallowing, sneezing, and vomiting, or some of the reflexes. So next, we also have pons. So the pons is like a bridge. Okay, It bridges the lower region of the brain to the higher regions, such as the midbrain and the forebrain. So that's the role of the pons. Next, we have here what we call the cerebellum, the blue part in the illustration so it's also known as the little brain and trivia the cerebellum contains more neurons than any other single part of the brain and what is the role of cerebellum it's in charge for movement balance coordination and fine motor skills so do you think this is important when we are trying to learn for example biking for example when you first learned how to walk course this is an important part so it's mainly in charge of body movement balance coordination so some researchers in biopsychology would say that the cerebellum is also important in the formation of certain habits so it's also involved in learning particularly when the learning is about is related to movement so it's involved not only in learning, but there are some evidences also saying that it plays a role in language. So when we get to the chapter about language, let's uncover the role of cerebellum in, in language and development. So now we are done with the oldest part of the brain. Let's go to the midbrain. So the midbrain, as you can see, it's the smallest in the three major divisions that I presented to you. And it's in charge of voluntary muscle movement, voluntary movement. And sometimes it's they say that it controls our eye muscles. They say that people with Parkinson's disease, they have a problem with midbrain functioning okay so let's see if along the way we're going to discuss about parkinson's disease now if you remember earlier in our discussion we said that people with schizophrenia have excess or too much dopamine in their body they said that there are some interventions for schizophrenia that attempts to lower the dopamine in the body but when you lower the dopamine or decrease the dopamine in the body, it might produce symptoms such as those demonstrated by people with Parkinson's disease. That's why they call it, if you have schizophrenia and you receive dopamine medication, 
and then you develop Parkinson's disease-like symptoms. They call that pseudo-Parkinsonism. So that's the side effect of taking medication for schizophrenia. Now, when you hear the brainstem in this course, what we are referring are the following parts. It's the it's the it com it's composed of the midbrain, the medulla, and the pons. So this area here is considered the brainstem. I've heard some trivia before saying that snipers in the army are trained to kill instantly by aiming their gun from a distance to the nose of the person. Why? Because they say that if someone is damaged by a bullet in the nose area, when it goes straight through the head, it damages the, the brainstem. And they say that damage to the brainstem will result to instant death. That's why snipers in the army are trained to aim at, at the parts of the face that is, that is, you know, if you hit that part of the face and the bullet goes through, it will damage the brainstem. In the midbrain, there's also what we call a reticular formation. So when we say a reticular formation, it's a network of nerve fibers that runs up through both the hindbrain and the midbrain. So it runs up through the brainstem. And reticular formation is particularly in charge of waking up and falling asleep. So there might be problem in the reticular formation when you are in a coma. And we are going to talk about this topic more when we get to the discussion about wakefulness and consciousness. Now, let's go to the youngest part of the brain, and that will be the forebrain. So, it consists of the cerebrum and numerous other important structures. So, they say that the cerebrum is very important in the following processes. Control cognitive, sensory, and motor functioning. They regulate temperature, reproductive functions, sleeping, eating, and display of emotions. Okay, so like empathy like love etc now let's learn about the specific parts first i know that you're familiar with the thalamus and its main function is it's a relay system it's a sensory relay station it means that when there's an incoming information to the brain it goes to the thalamus first most of the time before the thalamus directs the information to the to the part of the brain that will process that certain information. In other words, when you see something, the impulse will go to the thalamus first, and then the thalamus will direct the information to the occipital lobe. The same goes for other bodily functions. So that's the main role of the thalamus. It's the relay station. Okay, now, we also have here what we call the limbic system. So the limbic system is not just a single structure, but it's a group of structures in the brain composed of hypothalamus, amygdala, hippocampus, and cingulate gyrus. And these parts collectively, they are very important in emotion, memory, motivation, and regulation of autonomic and endocrine function. So, we will learn more about the specific processes of these parts. First, so I switched the image so that we will have a closer look on the parts of the limbic system. So, it's highlighted on the image here on the right side. So, I hope that you now have a better understanding of the appearance of the limbic system by looking at this image so first let's talk about the hypothalamus so it's here just under the thalamus so the role of the hypothalamus is mainly about regulation of major drives and motives such as hunger thirst temperature and sexual behavior it also controls the master gland, which is the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus is mainly in charge of not just any behavior, but motivated behavior related to our drives. 
Next, the cingulate gyrus. Okay, the cingulate gyrus, the green colored part of the image here, is a belt like structure in the middle of the brain and it plays an important role in attention and cognitive control. So that's the role of the cingulate gyrus. Well, the basal ganglia, okay, is a collection of structures surrounding the thalamus involved in voluntary motor control. So it may also be involved in, in disorders that involves problem when it comes to muscle or body movement. So along the way, when we discuss disorders that involve difficulty in controlling one's motor behavior, then we might mention the basal ganglia once again. So the limbic system okay, may also be involved in action-oriented activities. In other words, it's involved in activities that wherein you have a certain goal and you direct your muscles or your body to fulfill that goal such as, for example, in your hobbies, in, for example, exercising, etc. And it coordinates with the cerebellum that wherein it's also in charge of coordination and bodily movement like what I told you earlier. So, as you can see, it rarely happens that only one part of the body is in charge of a certain function. Most of the time, they, they coordinate with each other so that a certain function will be performed. Okay, now let's talk about the cerebrum or in the forebrain. Typically, when I ask people to imagine what the brain looks like, I rarely hear or see people imagining the hindbrain or the midbrain. Typically, what comes into mind is the cerebrum. So the cerebrum is the large halves of the brain composed of two hemispheres, the left and the right. We will talk about more about these later. And it is covered with convolutions or folds. So the folds that you can see here in the brain are called convolutions. So there are some researchers who would say that the intelligence of the person does not really depend on the size of the brain. So it doesn't mean that the larger your brain, the smarter you are. True, but not all the time. Some would say that smarter people tend to have more convolutions or folds in your brain. Okay, so that's an interesting area of research in biopsychology and cognitive psychology. Now, the cerebral cortex is the thin outer layer of the cerebrum in which much of human thought, planning, perception, and consciousness takes place. So what are the different parts of our cerebrum? First, we have here what we call the frontal lobe. So the frontal lobe is this part. So the frontal lobe makes up one third of the area of the cerebral cortex. At the same time, it's also the youngest from the evolutionary perspective. So it's in charge of what we call executive functions such as attention, planning, abstract thinking, control of impulses, creativity, and social awareness. I've read some research before saying that people who don't show empathy or helping behavior may have a problem in the certain part of their frontal lobe. So you can see social awareness was mentioned here. In other words, we can predict that if a person has a problem in the frontal lobe, then he or she is most likely to engage in antisocial behavior. Again, in psychology, antisocial doesn't mean that you are quiet or a loner, but rather an antisocial person is someone who performs behavior that violate the rights of other people. So the frontal lobe continues to develop until the early 20s. That explains why there are so many children and teenagers especially who engage in risky behaviors without thinking about its consequences because the frontal lobe of the brain matures during the early 20s. Okay, so now let's try to take a look at the case of Pinus Gage. This will somehow introduce the role of the brain in explaining abnormality. 
So when we explain abnormality, we can adapt different perspectives such as biological, psychological, or social. When we say that the abnormality is from social factors, we can say that person A likes to be thin or slim because his friends are saying that person A is overweight and overweight is not accepted in their culture. That's an example of social factors. When we say psychological, it may be what you think, for example, or what you feel. For example, you feel bad or you think that it's terrible to have, it's terrible to have an overweight body. So what you do is that you try to be as slim as possible. So that's the psychological factor in eating disorder. When we say biological factors in explaining abnormality, we what we are looking at are the biological threats, factors such as brain damage. So the case of Pinus gauge is one of is they say the first example first official example of how brain damage can alter personality and human behavior so when mr gage was laying railroad ties he was hammering an iron and then accidentally there was an explosion in the railroad after surprisingly he survived that incident however after the accident, the warm-hearted, the kind Mr. Gage turned into a stubborn, impulsive, argumentative, and sometimes he says offensive things. So these behaviors were not present before the brain damage. So this is one of the earliest examples of how brain damage can alter our personality. Okay, And eventually, we discovered that when there are parts of the brain that are damaged or that are removed, there may be changes in our behaviors. Not just in behavior, maybe in our thinking as well. For example, um, earlier I mentioned to you the limbic system and one important part of the limbic system is the amygdala. So the amygdala is in charge of detecting threats in the environment. It's also in charge of Although hippocampus is mainly in charge of memory, amygdala also plays an important role in memory, but it's important in what we call emotional memory. It's also important in detecting emotional threats. So the reason why you become afraid of certain things is the activity of the amygdala. amygdala. Now, what if we remove your amygdala? then it means that you will be fearless. However, although it sounds tempting to remove your amygdala, it's not advice because if you will not be fearless, then you can be impulsive. So what if you engage in activities that will threaten your life? For example, you go hiking, you go um, skydiving without fear then it means that you're willing to do these activities without protective equipment. Okay, so that shows that removal or damage to the certain parts of the brain may also impact, may also affect changes in our personality, decision making, thinking, cognition, memory, etc. Okay, now, so let us jump from the frontal lobe to other lobes of the brain. So one of the best way to make this change in topic is by discussing the primary motor cortex and the primary somatosensory cortex. So as you can see, the somatosensory cortex is no longer in, in the frontal lobe. It is, it is in the parietal lobe, but it is adjacent to the motor cortex, which is in the frontal lobe. Okay, so this area right here on the left, this is the motor cortex, okay? While this one here, the blue area, is the somatosensory cortex. So what is the role that these two parts of the brain play? Why are they adjacent to each other? Before I continue that discussion, first, let's try to know what is the main role of the parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe is the section in the top rear part of the brain. It is 
it is important in sensation and perception of touch. See, for example, a stranger grab your arm. Therefore, there will be an action potential going to the spinal cord, then going to the brain. And then the brain, um, specifically, it, the information will go to the thalamus and the thalamus will relay the information to the parietal lobe. Now, it will activate your somatosensory cortex and later on we will understand why is it why it is adjacent to the motor cortex okay so earlier i introduced the motor cortex to you now let's take a look at the somatosensory cortex so it's a strip of parietal lobe involved in processing information processing and perception of sensory information from the body, especially temperature, touch, pressure, and pain. In other words, take a look at the next slide. Okay, so now what's the connection between the somatosensory cortex and the motor cortex? So we understood that from the other slide that when we receive information from our senses, they go to the somatosensory cortex. So the part of the cortex responsible for that part of the body can be seen in this image here on the right side. So as you can see, the top part of the cortex is responsible for the hip, this one's responsible for the arm, etc. So what you can see here is the arrow is going to the cortex, which means that it is from the various parts of the body to the thalamus, then to the cortex, meaning it's sensory. On the other hand, the motor cortex is from the cortex going to the lower parts of the brain, ultimately to the spinal cord, and then to the peripheral nervous system. So as you can see, these parts are side by side in our image here on the top part, meaning that they are adjacent to each other. It means that the part of the brain involved in, in detecting the movements or the pressure in the hand is also adjacent to the part of the brain which will tell the hand what needs to be done. It's for easier communication between the parietal lobe, between the somatosensory cortex and the motor cortex. That's why they are adjacent to each other. Now you will notice that there are certain body parts that looks exaggerated in the image here. Why is the hand bigger than the torso? And why is the head bigger than other parts like the arm? What they're saying is that these enlarged parts represent more sensitive areas in the brain. That's why when somebody or something touches your hand, you are suddenly aware about it. Now imagine this scenario, what if there are ants or there are insects in your, in your knee or below the knee? We are not so aware about it because the parts of the brain in charge of the sensory information in these areas are not so sensitive, sensitive to the incoming information, okay? So th that explains the differences in the sizes, in the representation in this image. Okay, so other than the parietal and the frontal lobe, now let's talk about the temporal lobe. So its main function is primarily um, in sound inform processing sound information that arrives from the thalamus and it processes that sound information now there are some research saying that it is not only involved with sounds it is also involved when it comes to identifying objects so it cooperates with the vision and you will learn more about that when we get to the topic we will somehow have a free view about the topic when we go to Wernicke's area and Broca's area. So what are those areas? Let's see that. The Broca's area, okay, is the area in the brain, in the left frontal lobe, responsible for speech production. Okay, so 
damage in the broca's area may explain difficulty in speaking well if this area was discovered by paul broca in his autopsy of certain patients with difficulty in speaking after the discovery of the broca's area the vernicus area was discovered after that and if there's a part of the brain in charge of speech, which is the Broca's area, there's also part of the brain involved in understanding what others are saying. So this is the Wernicke's area. It's If the Broca's area is responsible for speech production, the Wernicke's area is responsible for understanding the meaning of what others are saying, the meaning of speech. Okay, now what I told you is that damages to this area may explain difficulties in, for example, naming objects or understanding what another person is saying. Eventually, if you have damages in this area, you may have what we call aphasia. And there are two types of aphasia. We will have more of these when we get to language. Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia. When if a person has Broca's aphasia, that is also known as non-fluent aphasia, if you have Broca's aphasia, it means that you can understand what others are saying to you because there's no damage in comprehension, but it's difficult for you to say what you want to say. That's Broca's aphasia, difficulty communicating what you want to communicate because the damage is with speech production. On the other hand, Okay, the Wernicke's aphasia is also known as fluent aphasia. So what is Wernicke's aphasia? If you have Wernicke's aphasia, you have difficulty understanding incoming information, but you can easily express what you want to say. Okay, so that's Wernicke's aphasia. We will go back to that when we discuss language. Now, just a trivia. Are you familiar with hallucination? When we see hallucination, particularly auditory hallucination, when there's auditory hallucination, what's happening is that a person with schizophrenia believes that someone is saying something to him or her, as if there's someone speaking to him or her, even though there's no sound or there's no one talking to him. So that's what auditory hallucination is. So neurologists hypothesize that maybe if you have auditory hallucinations then there is an overactivity in the Wernicke's area because you keep on hearing things even though nothing is present but you know what they discovered they discovered eventually that it is not the Wernicke's area that is hyperactive but it's the Broca's area so what does that mean so it means that if you have auditory hallucinations what you hear is not coming from the outside People with schizophrenia, among people with schizophrenia, what they hear is produced by their own brains because the Broca's area is the problematic part, meaning it tends to produce sound even if there's no input. So, in other words, what they, they explain that people with auditory hallucination may be... Um, what they hear is not coming from outside, but rather they produce what they hear. So that's an interesting discovery. Maybe along the way, we will hear about interventions with schizophrenia, intervention for schizophrenia wherein they try to suppress activity in the Broca's area. So that may be logical to do in interventions for schizophrenia. Anyway, let's, pro let's proceed to other topics. So you will know more about the Broca's and Wernicke's area moments from now when I discuss one example of one of the cases discussed in the textbook. But first, let me remind you that these areas are found in the left hemisphere of the brain and the, um, and the brain has two hemispheres, the left and the right. And these hemispheres work contralaterally, which means that the right side of the brain is basically in charge of the left side of the body and the left side of the brain is in charge of the right side of the body so it's contralateral there is no concrete explanation yet why our brain works contralaterally from an evolutionary perspective there's no enough evidence yet to say to explain why this phenomenon is happening 
But anyway, it's important for you to be reminded that the brain works contralaterally. And at the same time, these two hemispheres communicate with each other through what we call the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum basically bridges the left and right hemisphere in order for the information to go from one side to another for processing. Say for example, everything that you see on the left visual field, everything that's on your left will go to the right part of the brain and vice versa. Okay, and you will understand what I'm trying to say here when I discuss the example about the person who had difficulties naming objects that he can see. So what I'm showing on your screen right now are the specializations of the two hemispheres of the brain. So basically they say that the left hemisphere or the left, um, for those who utilize their left brain more, they're more likely to be adept or skilled in the following, like controlling your right hand, speaking and writing, calculating, logical thought processes, analysis, and reading. While on the other hand, those who rely more on the right hemisphere of the brain, of course, one evidence is that they control their left hand, they're more likely to be nonverbal. They do not rely that much on speaking or in language, but rather they're more likely to use music and art in expression and they're better when it comes to emotional recognition emotional thought and recognition processing the whole rather than the specific pattern recognition and facial recognition now before we move forward let me remind you that it's it really happens that a person relies only on one hemisphere but rather what we do is that most of the time we make use of both hemispheres of the brain and that's why the role of the corpus callosum is very important. You cannot claim that you are right-brained or left-brained just because you feel that you're more skilled in certain aspects like, I, like what I'm showing here on the screen. Not because you're good in music, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are right-brained. Okay, so that's one of the common misconceptions in psychology. So what you need to do is that all the, um, this is one of the from the neurological perspective what they advise is that if you really want to know which part of the brain or which hemisphere is more dominant do not look at these scales but rather you need to undergo functional MRI in order for you to see which of the two hemispheres of the brain is more active all right so that is it for the two hemispheres of the brain so during the 1960s, there was this prisoner who kept on experiencing epileptic seizures after a failed parachute jump. Now, there are some evidences during that time that if the bundle of nerves between the two hemispheres or the corpus callosum will be, will be removed, then it will also stop the epileptic seizures. However, nowadays it is no longer advisable to do. Why? Because look what happened to this man. After his corpus callosum was removed, he did not experience any epileptic seizure anymore. However, another problem has emerged. If he sees something in the left visual field, he cannot name that object. But if he sees something on the right visual field or the right part of the body, he has no problem naming that object. Why? What is happening in this case? Okay, so later on, I will make use of the graphic that you can see on the screen. But basically, what's happening is that remember that the brain is contralateral. Remember that Wernicke's and Broca's area, Broca's is for speech production and Wernicke's is for comprehension. So what happened with this person? So what happens is that if he sees something on the left side, he won't be able to name it. Why? If you see something with your left eye, left visual field, where does it go? To the right or the left part of the brain? To the right. Remember, information from the left side goes to the right side of the brain. But the part of the brain in charge of naming these objects are on the left. Meaning the information cannot cross to the left part of the brain that's why he cannot name these 
objects. Okay, so let's look at the graphic that you can see in the in the slide right now. In picture A, a person who had an operation to cut the corpus callosum is shown an object, specifically a hairbrush, to his left visual field. In B, okay, when asked what did he see, he said, I don't know. Because the language production area is on the left part, just like what I explained to you earlier. Okay? However, when he was asked by the examiner, can you get the object that you see? Okay? Can you use your left hand to get that object in front of you? You must get the object that is similar to what you saw on the screen. He was able to do it. In other words, yes, he has problem naming the object, but he, but he, did, not pro, he did not have a problem in identifying what the object looks like. Okay, so that's an interesting finding about corpus callosum, about naming objects, and the role of Broca's area in this situation. Okay, so to summarize what we talk about in this introductory lecture to structure of the nervous system, okay, so the hindbrain is composed of the following medulla, the pons or the bridge, reticular formation in charge of sleep, cerebellum in charge of bodily movement and coordination. Okay, and then the cortex is composed of frontal, temporal, parietal, and occipital lobe. But under the cortex, there are also structures and this is known as the limbic system composed of thalamus, hypothalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, and other important structures or parts. The hippocampus is in charge of memory and learning, while the amygdala is, may also play a role in memory, but it is more in charge of emotional memory. It is also in charge of other emotions such as fear and anxiety. So that's the amygdala. Now, other important areas in the cortex involve the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area. Okay? And the cerebral hemisphere are composed of the left and the right hemisphere. And these are the functions or the specializations. You can see them on the screen right now. 